name is Peter Fisher. Um, I'm CTO for Developer Tools at Julia Computing, which is a company that we formed to um, put some more concentrated resources behind the development of Julia. Um, I'm joined uh, by my colleague Bart from the Royal Military Academy in Belgium, and uh, he's going to give you an introduction to Julia as well as talk about his package, cxxwrap.jl, which is one of the two ways to interface Julia with C++. Afterwards, I'll talk about uh, my package that I wrote a while back, cxx.jl, which is the other way to interface Julia with C++. Um, but before we do that, uh, I figured I would just spend a couple of minutes sort of you know, catching you up on what's been happening in, in Julia land you know, over the past two or three years or so, and, you know, um, and just to, to give you a sense of, of what the Julia project is and what the Julia community is, because I always find that uh, important for, uh, for context. So I, I just put some you know, arbitrary numbers um, on the slide. The, the graph in the middle is just a stupid benchmark slide that you know, we've, we've showed forever, but the, you know, I'm not going to talk too much about it. You know, the benchmarks are not particularly interesting. But the point is, you know, Julia is sort of in the same performance category as C or C++, uh, is, is the point. Um, uh, in terms of the Julia ecosystem, you know, a lot has happened over the past, you know, just a couple of years. You know, if you knew Julia in 2014 and 2015, we had two or three hundred packages, you know, there's, oh, that has really exploded over the past, um, over the past three years. And, you know, we're almost 2,000 packages now. Um, the, you know, maintain and the number keeps growing. It's amazing um, the kind of things that are happening in the community. And similarly, if you look at other metrics of growth, like stars on GitHub, you know, uh, up and to the right. Uh, one thing I wanted to spend slightly uh, more time on is, is this slide, which is that, uh, you know, I mentioned there's all these packages in the Julia ecosystem, and uh, a lot of the very good work done is uh, organized around organizations. Uh, so these are, you know, Organizations, both in the GitHub sense of you know a collection of repositories, but also organizations in the social sense of you know people coming together in very specific areas to write very very um, advanced software in, in various disciplines. And some of these have sort of become industry standards. Um, in particular, I, I wanted to highlight Julia Opt and Julia with the G for mathematical optimization as well as sort of the probably the world's most extensive suite of differential equation solvers. Um, and you know, there's about 35 of them which are you know, formally organized as well as you know, the, the other uh, hundreds of packages just by individual people or companies. Um, but you know, I just wanted to give you a sort of idea of uh, focus areas that people in the community have rallied around. And, and these are just uh, six of the 35 formally organized um, Julia organizations. Uh, we have a conference. Last year it was in, in, in Berkeley. Uh, we had 300 people, it's usually five days, um, 150 talks. Uh, next year it'll be in London, or this year I guess it'll, it'll be in London in August, um, uh, which, which should be a lot of fun. And you know, there was a question earlier of what Julia is used for. And, you know, uh, on the Julia Computing website, we have a bunch of case studies in industry and, and, uh, in industry and academia. Um, that you know, customers and partners and friends uh, are using Julia for, and you know, I just took a screenshot of the first couple, but there's a, about ten more. So, um, you know, I, I hope this just gives the very rough context for what Julia is, and um, you know, if there's questions, uh, ask them later. But with that, I want to hand it over to Bart, who, as I mentioned, is going to give you an introduction to Julia, uh, a technical introduction to Julia, as well as talk about his package, and I'll be back in about 40 minutes to talk about uh, my package, CXX, etc. OK, thank you. So uh, the first thing I'm going to show is the Jupyter notebook that I will use for my uh, slides also. So who here has used Jupyter before? Uh, OK, about a bit less than half, let's say. So. The notebook here I wanted to show is from my course material at the Royal Military Academy. So uh, it's about uh, ship stability. And so basically you have a set of cells where you can enter code. It can be 
uh, a great many languages, even C++ nowadays, but here we use uh, Julia, of course, so using some packages. And then the nice thing is that you can use a, a manipulate macro in front of a, a function, for example, and it will generate user interface elements. And so here, for example, I show on a simple uh, rectangular approximation of a ship how the, the important points uh, change if you change the, the angle of heel of the ship. And so you can choose when changing the angle whether you stay in the reference of the ship and so the waterline will tilt or you can go to the uh, reference of the, the ocean, let's say, and you can make the, the ship itself tilt and see how the, how the points change position. So that's just the, the general idea about the Jupyter notebooks uh, that I'm using also for my slides. So now to start the actual presentation, I'm going to start off with a short bio. So mainly uh, to show that uh, my experience in C++ is a lot longer than it has been in uh, Julia so far. So like I mentioned, I work at the uh, only federal university in uh, Belgium, which belongs to the defense. Uh, in C++, I got started on the K3D project, uh, which has been shown here by the previous maintainer, uh, Tim Shedd, on uh, BoostCon 2007, because he was using uh, Boost Python. Uh, and this is a direct link to the today, in fact, because uh, based on that, on the, the way Boost Python works, uh, I uh, developed a CXX wrap package for Julia. And so I also gave a talk previously here uh, using uh, Boost Proto with Eigen uh, for uh, expression templates. So the three main packages I'm active in in Julia are CXX wrap itself, which I will be talking about today. QML.jl, which uses CXX Wrap to uh, make the QML user interface from the Qt project available to Julia programs. And then Trillinos.jl, which is a large scientific library, which I'm also trying to wrap using CXXWrap.jl. So a short outline. I will start with a general introduction on Julia and why it was uh, developed. Uh, then uh, the general intro about Julia will be from a C++ programmer perspective, so highlighting uh, a bit the differences and the similarities between the two languages. Then we will have the discussion about the, the two languages. The link to the code repository for this presentation and uh, the slides and so on is also on the schedule on the schedule uh, on the site. So. So why, uh, or what's the main motivation uh, behind Julia? So the idea is that we can have a language that is both easy to use and yields uh, code at a, a speed that you would expect from a modern computer. So at the same order of magnitude or at the same level as uh, typical C or C++ code. So why is this important for me personally? Uh, it's because my students, uh, when I have a research code in C++, it's very difficult to get them to work on that. Uh, you have to have real, uh, let's say it kindly, hobbyists that uh, do additional programming in their spare time. And then you might find someone every two to three years, let's say. But uh, it would be much nicer if you had a simple language that would still result in research code that runs at an acceptable speed on a compute cluster, for example. So that's the promise that Julia makes. and. Uh, after verifying that it really does that, I uh, started working uh, with it. So then, uh, what is Julia exactly? So it's a high-level uh, programming language that's initially being developed for scientific computing, although it's powerful enough for uh, any, let's say, regular programming tasks. It's a dynamic language, so it's a bit uh, it's like Python in that respect, that you can uh, just launch the interpreter and start typing codes. Uh, unlike Python, it's strongly typed, so everything uh, has a typed link to it, although if you compare to C++, it's mostly like if you type auto everywhere, so you don't have to bother with the types if you don't want to. And everything is just in time compiled using the LLVM um, compiler. Uh, 
there's a native interface to C, and the central concept of the language is that we can have uh, dynamic multiple dispatch so that the functions to call are chosen at runtime or if possible at compile time based on all the arguments that are passed to the function. So let's start off with a brief introduction. So to define uh, a function uh, in Julia the code is like this with the function keyword and the familiar return statement. Or for such a short one line function, you can easily shorten this using add a b. Is it readable for everyone or is it a bit too small? So these are both equivalent ways to declare uh, and implement a function. And then of course, if we run that, we get the unsurprising results. And note that we can run it for integers or for floating points. And uh, the same function just works. So the Julia is a strongly typed language, but here we didn't see any types yet. So it depends a bit here on the literal that you type. If we type an integer, it by default on a 64-bit machine will be an in 64. So it has a strong type link to it. The same uh, with the result of the addition. And if we go to floats, there are uh, promotion rules. So here if we add uh, an integer and a float, it will give a, a float as a result. So let's look at the assembly of both of these functions. So Julia has a very nice macro, uh, add code native, that will, when you uh, put the function call behind it, it will print out the uh, assembly code um, that you get. So for both of our versions, we see that it generates different assembly based on the fact if we are adding integers or adding floating points. So the, I don't really understand assembly, but I think that this line here and here it says add, so I suppose that's the line that adds the, the two numbers together. And so you see uh, on the fly, uh, the first time you invoke a function for a certain combination of types, the LLVM will be invoked to generate the proper version of, uh, of the code. So let's compare that with C++. In fact, the, the function we defined so far in C++, if you would want to get the, the same behavior in C++, you could define a templated function like this. So here, uh, it's also valid for any A and B, and uh, you get basically the same behavior uh, as you do in Julia, except that I think the Julia syntax is slightly lighter uh, in this case. Then uh, let's take a look at how we can uh, define a type. So uh, the, the basic keyword to define a type is uh, struct. Uh, and then we can just add the fields um, followed by two colons to indicate the type of each field. You don't have to put a type. So if you want to write a quick prototype, you can uh, just write the name of the field. And it will be of type any, which is the base class of any uh, type in Julia. But then uh, you will get more dispatching at runtime and it will impact performance negatively. So if you know the type, it's best to, to put it. Um, in the case of a struct definition anyway. So we can automatically we get a constructor that takes all the fields if we don't define any constructor by ourselves. Uh, so the add function that we had previously, obviously it will not work on uh, my num because uh, the base Julia language doesn't know how to add uh, this user defined type. So we can uh, create an overload for the, the add function here. Uh, and now we see that it says that add is now a generic function with two methods. So basically if we define the function of which the name exists already, with a different uh, typing on the arguments, we add a method. And we can get for every function a list of the methods. So now we have the one we defined first and then the one including the my number. And so then it works as you would expect. Um, and because we define it to return a my number, it returns uh, a my number. 
Uh, Julia also supports uh, inheritance. So unlike C++, here we have a single inheritance and you have to inherit from abstract types. So you cannot, co cannot inherit from a concrete type. Uh, small examples, we have a base type uh, called myBase, which is declared using this syntax. And then we can add a concrete type with, it, with the less than colon operator, let's say, uh, is set to derive from uh, myBase. Julia comes with uh, introspection tools, so you can then uh, use supertype on the name of the type to get back the concrete type. And you can use that also in, uh, when you want to declare a type of something, you can put colon, colon, supertype, and so on. That, uh, that works. Uh, we can define a, f uh, a function on that using the, the base class as the type, so it will work on anything that is derived from my base. It just gets the, the field value here. And so if we, concrete, uh, we create one of these concrete types and get the value, it returns uh, the value as expected. Then let's talk a bit about uh, constness, or as it's called in the Julia world, mutability. So when you try to modify the field of the type you just created, you will get an error because the, if you just put struct as the declaration of the type, it will be immutable or const by default. It's as if you define a struct in uh, C++ where all the fields have const in front of them. And so to reiterate, you should put const int and not int const, right? I think there's a discussion going on here about that. <laughs> uh, okay, so how do we make a mutable type then? Because that's possible also. Then we just put mutable in front of the struct keyword and then uh, for the rest, I left the implementation of the, uh, of the type the same. If we create that one, uh, we can change the value of the field. And because our get a function just accessed the a field of the object it is passed, uh, this function still works. So that's uh, an important point because uh, it might seem that not having concrete inheritance is overly restrictive, but it is only restrictive on the fields you define inside of your struct. So if you have defined a base method that uses the same field uh, names as in all the derived types, you don't have to redefine the methods themselves. Yeah. Um, you have a member function or method or, add or, uh, or methods free functions. All methods are free functions in Julia. Yeah, yeah. you can not. Yeah. Okay. You cannot have a. Except for the constructor. The constructor you define inside the type. but. Uh, you might answer this question later, so I apologize because I'm jumping ahead, but with, if you have shared mutable data, is there something like a borrow checker? I don't know if you're familiar with Rust, where you pass it to some other method, and if it's mutable to different places, it, it won't work. Is, that, is there something like that in Julia, or is it just, if it's mutable, it's just mutable? Uh, not currently. There's some thinking on how to do that in the Julia sort of mindset. Um, on one hand, on the one hand, Julia is sort of the extreme opposite of that approach because we don't want to enforce anything at compile time, and you know the only problem you might get would be performance issues at runtime. So, sort of a you know, strict borrow checking uh, in the compiler doesn't really work for us. But there might be other approaches where you know there can be annotations that the compiler can rely on, and if it can prove the the borrower invariance, then it'll generate fast code, and otherwise it'll generate you know, dynamic checks or something of that extent. So there's some thoughts on that, but currently uh, that is not a problem to address. Okay, thank you. So then uh, about uh, generic types. So Julia has uh, what in C++ or uh, template types, except we use curly braces and not less than, greater than. Uh, so here is a small example using a tuple to uh, encapsulate uh, a point. Uh, yeah, I think it speaks a bit for, uh, for itself. Uh, so you have the type of each of the coordinates and you have the number of dimensions that you want to put. So you can then, uh, you get a default constructor. And so if I put a tuple here, which is just between uh, braces, the list of numbers, we get something of the type in 64 as the type of the coordinates and uh, of dimension 3, of course, in this case. 
So if I pass different parameters, I get a different uh, type. And uh, a bit of a difference for now with C++ uh, is that in C++ you could take two non-type um, parameters and then combine them to create a new type that does uh, arithmetic on those non-type parameters. But right now in Julia, this is not yet possible, although it uh, will probably be in the future. So then uh, about the, the multiple dispatch. So basically, um, the multiple dispatch in Julia uh, means that it will look up the function based on all of the arguments you uh, passed it. And it can, uh, at the basis, it happens dynamically. But if the compiler can figure it out at compile time, it will be done at compile time. So then you avoid the lookup in the tables and so on. Uh, that would need to be done in the dynamic case. So I'll just skip to the example. Let's say we have a heterogeneous array. So here I put uh, an integer, a float, and an array inside an array. So of course, the element type of the array will be any, because it, there is no common base that is more specific than that to any of these elements. We can then call the norm function on each element of the array. There is a short syntax for that by adding a dot after the function name. Uh, which is called broadcasting. I don't have time to go into it, but it's a very powerful feature of, uh, of Julia. And so we then get the norm of each of the elements, and there it's figured out that the common base type for all of these was uh, the abstract number type real. So that's what we get as a result. So then, because every type has a different, every element has a different type, uh, it has to dynamically dispatch for the norm. So in C++, how would you solve this problem? If you had a container of different things uh, and you had to call a norm function of every one of them? Excuse me? You call common type? Yeah, you, you may create a common base type and then you have a virtual function called norm and then uh, it's basically the same thing at runtime. It will uh, dispatch and call the correct norm function for every element. Okay, so that's... Uh, perfectly doable in both languages. So now let's add a second array, also <coughs> of type any, with types that don't necessarily um, have a common base class uh, in common with the, the first container. And then let's add the elements of these two containers together. So in Julia, what happens here, because both of the arrays are uh, of uh, an element type that's not defined at compile time, it will for every combination of the two elements of the container, look up the correct plus function defined on the types of the left element and the right element. And so this is, uh, let's say, an important difference with C++, because in C++ you only have the, let's say, the first argument to the function, which you put before the dot in C++, on which it can dispatch dynamically. Um, can you say a few words about uh, how uh, virtual function calls, including in presence of multiple virtual arguments, are implemented. Is it using vectors and, and integer indices or, or hash maps? Or I, I'm afraid I can't say anything on I that. Can, can, it's, it's very complicated, actually. So, um, so the, uh, I should probably use the microphone. So the question was, how is this implemented? And uh, the first thing I want to say about that is that um, the only reason we're fast is because the compiler is very good at basically what you would call the virtualization in the C++ world, which is you know, at compile time when it does specialization, looking up which method gets called and then doing all the standard interprocedural analysis. Uh, obviously, it can't do that forever. Uh, it can't do that in all cases. So um, in, in those cases, you know, it, it, needs to do, um, it needs to do the dynamic dispatch. Uh, the way that is implemented, um, conceptually, we have uh, a partial order of specificity and we, uh, according to which we can sort the methods. And then it, what conceptually does is it goes through and picks the first signature that matches um, in specificity order. Um, this is too slow for most cases. So there's various levels of caching um, for simple signatures and, um, and you know, anything else that, um, and, you know, there's call side caches for um, repeatedly visited call sites. So it is not as fast as virtual functions. 
Yeah, but we don't. But the point is that we don't actually do virtual dispatch most of the time. Mm -hmm. like it's very rare in a performance sensitive function to have a virtual dispatch. Um, and it, it is still pretty fast. It's you know, if it's cached properly in, in the last level cache, it's you know, within a factor of two of virtual functions. But it is not constant time. No. Just want to add one small thing is that there's a macro in Julia called at uh, code warn type, which will show you in red uh, the places where you risk having dynamic dispatch. So you can optimize those away if, uh, if the code allows it or if you made an error where there shouldn't be any dynamic dispatch, uh, but it happens anyway. Okay, so then a short uh, summary table where I just wanted to. Um, highlight the differences. So for inheritance, we have a single and abstract inheritance, while C++, of course, has multiple and concrete inheritance. Though I think multiple inheritance might happen in the future, right? Has been discussed a bit, but <laughs> I'm hoping in, for in, it. In, in some way, it will probably not look like standard multiple inheritance. Yeah. The constants then is at the type level in Julia and at the uh, variable level uh, for C++. All functions are free in Julia. Uh, we have both templates. So the difference I spoke about with the computed field types that, uh, that may happen uh, in the future. Uh, we have introspection in Julia, which I think is very nice. And in fact, in the development of CXX wrap, not having it in C++ was a, a bit of a, of a headache at times. The difference between the dispatching was uh, already explained at length. Uh, it's not single dispatch, you just administrated it. <coughs> single dispatch is well, Yeah, it's, it's part of the mold. It's a special case. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not a separate dispatch system. Yeah. Right? C has two dispatch systems one for multiple dispatch and static case, and for single dispatch through virtual functions. And Julia is just a special case. And then the last one I wanted to add, because apparently it's still a point of discussion for C++, but we can overload DOT. <laughs> uh, is, is comma an operator? Uh, no. uh, one, one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now uh, I'll go uh, quickly over the CXX wrap, uh, .gl package. So basically it's uh, boost.python, but then for Julia. So it's for the people who already have uh, Python wrappers written in Boost Python of their C++ code. Transitioning to Julia based on that would be very easy. Uh, also, it's for people who prefer writing their code in C++ rather than Julia. So that, uh, that's the main difference with uh, the CXX.gl uh, package that will be discussed afterwards. So first, the preliminaries are there's already a native C interface in Julia, so you can uh, use the C call function with then either a symbol name that's already loaded into memory or um, the name of the library and the symbol name or a pointer to a function as the first argument and then you pass the types or the, the return type, the types of the arguments and then the arguments themselves. So for example here the absolute value fun function from the C standard library. Uh, we can show that the overhead is quite low, so Benchmark Tools is a package that does micro-benchmarking in a very uh, nice way. So we can just benchmark this, it says almost 4 nanoseconds, and then uh, the native Julia version takes uh, about 2.5 nanoseconds. So for such a small function, we see that uh, even though there is some overhead, it's not, uh, not up to the point where this will be prohibitively expensive if the function does real work. In fact, if it's a really big function, then the, the overhead will be completely unnoticeable. So what is the basic approach on CXX wrap? It's that we will generate uh, pointers to functions uh, that can be called directly using C call, automatically using a syntax similar to Boost Python. So let's dive in straight uh, to an example, a hello world, world example. So I want to call here the hello function. Uh, and similar to uh, Boost Python and PyBind 11, we just start with a, a macro that starts and ends our uh, module. Uh, we create 
here the create module function will create a Julia module, which is a kind of package or a kind of namespace you can think of it in C++ terminology. And then we can just add uh, methods to this. Uh, so here the hello method directly by the, the pointer to the function or we can also add a lambda, for example, that does the same thing. Then to compile this, there's a short CMake file. It's in the, in the tutorial itself as well. And then running this uh, in Julia, you just have to give the path to the shared object that was generated uh, by compiling the C++ codes. And then when we load this uh, shared object using the wrap modules function, which comes from the CXX wrap Julia package, it will create the Julia module and uh, the functions that are inside it. So after that, we can just uh, call in the hello module, the hello function, and it works uh, as expected, whether it's the, the lambda or the, the regular function. So behind the scenes, uh, I'll, given the, the time, not go into this too deeply, but obviously the macro, it generates a C function that is at some point called using C call from Julia. Uh, there are some other entry points in the, in the library as well. Uh, but so to, uh, to build the method itself, uh, the method function uh, is declared like this. So it's very good that we have variadic templates for this kind of work in uh, C++. Otherwise, it would be very painful to account for all possible number of function arguments. And we then, uh, with this method function, we create an object that is later on passed to Julia. So it contains all the argument types and so on, uh, and the pointers to use. So we can have a basic function pointer, which is the pointer to the C function, but the function may not be callable as a C function. For example, if you have a lambda, you need to wrap it up in a, a standard function, and then it will have an extra argument, which is the tongue here, uh, which is actually a pointer to a standard function from uh, C++. Uh, so this is basically the, I'll, I'll skip over this because otherwise I will run uh, out of time. So this is basically the C function that gets put here in the function pointer, which can take then the functor, uh, which is cast back to um, a standard function. Uh, so why are we doing all this? The main difference with Python uh, when you want to write uh, an interfacing library is that it is uh, very difficult uh, using the Julia C runtime and its public C interface. It is very difficult to define a method directly in C code. So what I have to do or the easiest thing to do is to pass the required data structure to Julia and then use Julia metaprogramming to build the functions themselves on the Julia side. So that's, that's basically how it works for functions. So I will show you how efficient this is now. Uh, basically, we have a function that loops over all the elements in an array and then multiplies every element by 0 0.5 and stores the result in another array. So that's intentionally very simple. And we will benchmark how long it takes by calling in the inner loop the function in different ways. So we call a regular function, a regular Julia function here. We call a regular C function using C call a regular C++ function using CXX wrap and a lambda and so on. And for reference, we did the same loop purely in C++, so where we have the for loop implemented in C++. And so then the resulting timings are this. So we see that uh, Julia and C++, as, uh, as promised uh, by the onset in, uh, in Julia, they are at the same level, which is logical in this case because uh, it calls LLVM in the background here on my Mac, uh, it calls Clang for the C++ code, so there's uh, probably the same machine code behind these two uh, functions. If we replace the whole function by calling into a C library directly, we see that there is some overhead appearing, but it's not dramatic. And it's the same if we use CXX wrap with a regular C function. So a, a regular function, with that I mean uh, that it has argument types that can be passed directly to Julia and that there's no fancy things like a lambda or anything, so there is no standard 
function necessary to wrap the object that we are calling. If we have a lambda, and then we have the standard function overhead which get ad gets added. And then another interesting case is if we uh, implement the loop in C++, but from C++ C++ call in the inner loop uh, Julia function. So you can get to a compiled Julia function, uh, you can get a pointer uh, to this function and call it as a C function. And then we see that also in that case, the overhead gets slightly higher, but it's still for functions that do something more complicated than just multiplying two numbers, the overhead of calling a Julia function from C++ is perfectly acceptable. Then, uh, to expose the, the types, uh, again, the syntax is quite similar to what we have in Boost uh, Python. So we can, here we define just a small toy class. We have the add type function, which takes as a template parameter the C++ type and as a string, the type name that you should have in uh, Julia. Uh, you can then, with, if you don't immediately close this statement, you can add dots to add all the methods that you want to wrap. So here we just add get a, and we say that it has a constructor taking an integer as an argument. So then on Julia, doing the same thing as before, we can create this uh, function or this type here, uh, and call a function on it, and it returns the expected results because we passed the 42 to the constructor here. Note the A allocated here, so that's the type that we have created, and the void pointer, which is a pointer to the C++ object itself. So why is it A allocated and not just A? So in fact, wrapping a type creates three different types. One abstract type that is named, uh, the name that was actually given, and then a reference type and an allocated type. The difference has to do with memory management. So if you have called a constructor, internally it will have uh, allocated the object on the heap with new. Uh, so it would be good if someone at some point called also the delete function. And so that's why we have the allocated type, which is a mutable struct, which can have in Julia a finalizer associated to it. And so if the object goes out of scope and the garbage collector gets called on it, or you finalize it manually, the destructor gets called and we don't have any memory leaks. On the other hand, let's say you have a function in C++ managed memory that returns a reference to an A, then it will return the constant type A ref, which is uh, not garbage collected or which will not call the destructor internally, which is also good to avoid uh, very nasty crashes of the program. Uh, it's also an additional benefit that the A type itself is abstract because in C++ we do have concrete inheritance. So this means that every wrapped C++ type can inherit from another uh, wrapped C++ type because they are all abstract as far as Julia is concerned. So now I have a lot of slides about the more complicated cases involving inheritance and templates, but uh, I propose <coughs> to skip over those to give enough time to Kino for uh, the cxx.gl. Uh, so maybe we can come back to this if there happens to be enough time at the end. So one more small thing I want to show is the package, the real use case I have for CX6 wrap, which is wrapping uh Solving a partial differential equation on a grid, here uh, just the Laplace equation, which is uh, gives you a solution here, a double parabola with one at the top. And so one performance sensitive part of this is the assembly loop, where you basically loop over all the elements and then call C++ code here. This is basically from the Trillinus tutorial, the, the basic example. So if you would wrap this directly in Python, for example, having a for loop calling lots of wrapped functions here would be extremely slow. In the wrapped Julia code, it looks almost the same as the C++ code. And we can see that the performance of both versions, in this case, we have the matrix filling function. It's also on the same level. So here I selected the benchmark that was faster for Julia. On the other machine, it was the other way around. But I conclude that they are at the same, more or less the same performance level. There would be no real reason why 
Julia would be faster than C++ in this case. Uh, but uh, it's on the same level, let's say. So I think it's time to pass uh, over to Kino. Yeah, sure. Are there any general Julia questions I can answer? Was it named after someone's girlfriend? <laughs> uh, no, it was not. Unfortunately, the naming story is very boring. Somebody just suggested it outside the code of Elpis, and it was thought to be a good name, and it stuck. Um, we've made up various stories, so I can you know, tell you one of them <laughs> over, over drinks later. Uh, a good thing to say is that it's named after the mathematician, mathematician Gaston Julia of the Julia set. So that's a good one. It's not true, but it's a good story. Um, did, you, did you look at other uh, multiple dispatch systems like uh, CLOS, Dalian, Clover? Uh, yeah, so we're broadly aware of them. There are some design differences. Um, but I personally wasn't involved in the early design of the system. I joined about two years after the first code was written by at which point sort of the, the basic design decisions were already decided. So I can't say exactly which parts were chosen because they were that way in another system. Um, For example, does the argument order can influence the resolution, for example, in presence of ambiguity? So you get in, for ambiguities, you get an error uh, is the current design. Um, we have talked before about resolving ambiguities in favor of the first argument, but that didn't really seem too popular. I think it's a horrible idea. Yeah. Are those ambiguities supposed to be hidden behind the name space of the module or scope? Yeah. So um, there's, there's very, I mean, pe people disagree on, on, on uh, whether it, it does what they want, but basically no, no namespace in Julia is privileged. Uh, the only sense in which a namespace is privileged is that the prompt is attached to a specific namespace, which uses a specific standard library. So, you know, if you use that one, then people complain, oh, the standard library is privileged, but, you know, you could attach the prompt to a different standard library. And that's, in fact, a useful technique sometimes when you're working on the compiler. You can spin up a prompt uh, attached to the new copy of the compiler, so you can test compiler changes. Um, while still sort of maintaining the interactivity being compiled by the old compiler if it's not quite stable yet, so. Uh, so, so my other question about introspection, can you remotely introspect real time? Uh, remotely as in out of process or? Yeah, from a different computer maybe? So um, there is distributed computing facilities uh, that have been there for a very long time. Um, which, you know, you can basically do arbitrary remote procedure calls, including introspection. Um, out of process introspection is interesting. I have a, I have something that does it, but it's not particularly stable yet, and it's something we're working on. Okay. Um, but in, in theory, it's possible, and there's you know various fancy things you can do, but it, it not something that you know the average user would do at the moment. Okay, uh, I think we're good on the recording, so. Um, Hi again, everyone. Just to reiterate, since I know a couple of people walked in late, uh, my name is Kano Fisher. I work at Julia Computing, which is a company that we founded uh, to advance the development of Julia, of the core developers of the um, Julia, uh, the original creators are amongst my co-founders. Um, and what I'm going to be talking to you about is my package, uh, cxx.jl, which is a standard Julia package. You know, you can get it as you can any Julia package, which just typing pkg.add cxx if you have Julia installed locally. Um, as of right now, this may or may not work. Uh, it has a significant binary dependency because it ships a C++ compiler, uh, which is always a bit of a nightmare to get working on arbitrary user systems. Uh, we have a solution to this in the next version of Julia where we um, streamline all of this, which it should just work. I had hoped it would be done by now, but as, as software is always, uh, the release is late. So uh, in, in, in a month or two, this will, uh, I can guarantee you this will work right now. It'll, it'll work if you have like a standard Linux system or an OS X system and you know, anything more exotic, you might run into weird compiler errors. Um, okay, but what CXX is, it's basically the opposite approach to uh, Bard's CXX wrap package. So in CXX wrap, 
uh, you define all the glue code in C++. So you know you have a C++ file that declares, okay, these are the these are the functions I want to expose to Julia, and then it uses the Julia C API to you know create the runtime data structures that to the Julia runtime system specify what um, functions and types are available. Um, CXX takes the opposite approach. So CXX, uh, rather than you know using the Julia interface to create Julia types, it loads a copy of Clang in memory and uses Clang to parse C++ code and generate uh, C++ in memory. Um, now, uh, this, uh, in order to do this in a dynamic language, you sort of have to have you know, a dynamic version of C++. Um, and if you have that already, what you can immediately get is basically a C++ REPL, which uh, CXX provides and is one of the uh, most popular features of the library, actually. So uh, the Julia REPL has this notion of REPL nodes, where you know if you hit semicolon, you get a shell. Um, if you hit question mark, you get help. And uh, this is you can plug into this. Um, so when you after loading the CXX package, if you hit the if you hit the less than key, um, you know you get a you get a CXX REPL, and and this um, behaves basically as you would expect. Um, and you know, I'm, if I make typos, let me know. Um, in line with C++ code and the Julia code, is that basically the idea? Yeah. So the idea is basically, you know, uh, in, in you know, CXX wrap.jl, you write a bunch of glue code in C++, and then it exposes that to Julia. The fundamental idea with CXX is um, that you can mix and match Julia and C++ sort of very naturally within the same program. Because I really hate glue code, you know, whether manually written or generated, because there's, there's just all sorts of problems with it. So, you know, I, I'm a compiler person, so I said, okay, I, I have a compiler, I can fix this. Um, so I, I can write Julia and C++ in, in, the, same, um, uh, in the same program. Um, and you can, you can access variables back and forth. So let's say I defined uh, a variable like globe is world. Um, Julia has Unicode variable names. Uh, then I could do things like um, like that, right? So. Uh, what happened here, right, I had a, I had a variable in Julia uh, called Unicode globe, um, and then the, the dollar sign in front of it um, uh, means interpolation, and it's a sort of generic interpolation syntax in Julia it's used for string interpolation and command interpolation. Um, one thing to point out, though, um, is that this interpolation is not string interpolation, it's semantic interpolation. So you know, it didn't somehow print out world to a string and then splice that string in there and then parse that. It you know parsed basically you know think of SQL prepared statements right and said okay something else goes here, um, and then it uh, did it at the um, at the actual type level. Uh, this works uh, the other way around in the REPL um, by uh, having special assignment syntax. So if I say you know. A is did string C++, and then I look at A. Yeah, sorry for the compile time delay. It's currently compiling uh, C++ introspection code. But so one, you know, uh, this is sort of the de the default printing of this. And if I um, the, for a std string, there's you know standard standard conversions defined to to the equivalent Julia type. Um, but what I wanted to point out with this is that uh, C++ values retain their C++ character in the Julia program. So basically what CXX does is it reflects some approximation uh, of the C++ type hierarchy um, into Julia and retains C++ values as C++ values uh, for the primary reason that this way you can put them back into C++ um, and have the round trip um, 
uh, not affect uh, what you get. So you know, this is the, the the printing is horrible, and you know you can you can define printing. But what I wanted to show with this example is that you know things retain their C plus plus characteristic in in Julia. Okay, so uh, let's do a couple more fun examples of this kind, and then I'm gonna. Uh, um, um, Semicolons. Uh, what did I do? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Okay, well, let's skip this. Um, uh, okay, so uh, the previous example didn't work, but uh, I don't know why I'll have to debug it. But um, uh, what this does, so the colon in front of the parentheses in Julia quotes an expression. So rather than interpolating a value, this interpolated an, um, uh, this interpolated an expression. So every time you know, it hits this line in the C++ code, it will actually go and so it will go and call that function, or rather what it did is it asked the Julia compiler to generate you know, code corresponding to generating, um, uh, generating a, random, a random integer. Um, and uh, you can nest this, which I'm not going to show because uh, nesting it takes too much space on the screen, but basically you, know, you can call back into C++ from, from inside the callback and then call back into Julia and pass functions back and forth and it gets complicated very fast and it's oftentimes not useful but sometimes it is when you have like a loop in one or the other language and you want to use a variable um, defined um, defined in the otoscope. Um, okay uh, so now I'm gonna uh, switch gears slightly um, uh, and work with a C++ quaternions file that I found on the internet. Um, I'm not going to go through it, but it you know it looks like standard C++. Uh, it's a it's a templated class that does computations on quaternions, right? So um, Right, so I can define, you know, a quaternion in um, a quaternion in C++, and using the special syntax that we defined er that we saw earlier, I can assign it to a Julia variable. And in this case, you know, the standard printing is slightly more useful than this for for std string. And you can see, okay, you know, A is of class quaternion double um, with um, with x, y, and z uh, members. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to define I'm going to define addition and multiplication, and I'm going to tell Julia, okay, anything that is a C++ value, because remember values retain the C++ characteristic. In order to add those values on the Julia side, you know, uh, go back to C++, and I apologize that this wraps over the line, but ICXX basically is, says inline C++. Uh, which basically just means that it's at function scope rather than at global scope. Um, and you may be able to see it or may not, but you know, the, the idea is basically, okay, Julia, whenever you want to add two values that came from C++, put them back into C++ and do you know, static overload resolution in C++. Um, and you know, uh, this, this works as you would expect. Um, Assuming the C++ library is correct, I didn't actually check, but it, it did something. So, uh, you know, uh, good enough, good enough for the example, right? Um, so, uh, one aspect of Julia, since everything is generic, you know, we defined um, we defined plus and we defined multiply, but we can also so um, carry it in Julia's exponentiation. So, a squared is defined 
uh, automatically on A, even though A is a C++ value that you know um, Julia doesn't know anything about other than that it knows how to how to multiply it, right? So that's that's sort of one of the uh, I, I want to pause here a little bit because this right here is something that actually makes Julia extremely powerful um, because Julia takes generic programming and you know dials it up to eleven because even though you know the Julia standard library that defines exponentiation doesn't know anything about C++ and C++ doesn't know, uh, the C++ library doesn't know about anything about exponentiation because of the way that dynamic multiple dispatch works. Um, uh, these work together no problem. Um, and I uh, want to expand on that just uh, slightly more. So uh, I'm going to define a couple more methods and just show how one would work with this. Um, because the the primary reason that I initially developed CXX.jl when I was in college was because I wanted to interactively explore C++ libraries that I didn't know. So you know, when I get to a new C++ library, they're often you know, huge APIs that are terrifying and you know, things don't compile and everything, everything is horrible. But I found it actually very nice to just sort of start at the REPL and, and build interactively in sort of this kind of interactive setting. Uh, so that's what this is for, and you might see some of the remnants of that. But um, I want to show a little bit of what I would do with things like that. So you know, this is the default printing, but you know, we might want, um, uh, you know, we we might want uh, slightly, you know, more compact printing um, for for it to fit on a line. So I can tell Julia, okay, you know, when you encounter something and there's a, another another macro called cxxt which is you know c++ but in, in type context you know um, uh, when you encounter a quaternion class templated on a julia type parameter dollar t so this where t syntax is how you do basically template type name t explicitly um, in julia and i'm going to talk about that slightly more in just a second but you know you basically you can uh, template C++ types on Julia types, including um, uh, type parameters. And this basically just tells Julia, okay, when you want to display any C++ quaternion type, um, you know, what you do is you print out, you know, all the four components with, um, with the relevant basis elements and, um, and all of that. Um, so I, I promised I'd talk a little bit more about the, um, uh, the syntax out here. So um, this, this is actually first class syntax. So you can define basically a type alias. Um, you can basically define a type alias that um, uh, by explicitly introducing one of these type variables and you know, parameterize a C++ type over it. And this is useful for things like you know, standard vector, right? If you, have wrap a C++ library that has a standard vector of something and you want to say, okay, you know, I, I can do the norm of a standard vector of this type more efficiently, right? You can, um, it, it basically allows you to integrate C++ values directly into Julia. Um, and another thing we can do is um, uh, actually define a Julia site constructor for this C++ type. And I apologize about the syntax. This is the last version of Julia, which uh, was in the middle of transitioning the syntax, so it'll look nicer in the next version. Um, basically, what what this would allow you to do is, you know, write um, write a Julia constructor. This table is very wobbly. Um, write a Julia constructor and you know get a get a C plus plus object back, and just um, to make the point, uh, I didn't actually define. I, I added the object directly to the C plus to the Julia representation of the C++ object. So if I now did something like, uh, let's say long um, on, you know, one, two, th three, four, um, you know, that, that also works as does, you know, uh, interpolating a Julia type as the, as the type parameter. And you know, all, kinds of, all kinds of cool stuff, right? You get the point. Basically the point is integrate Julia and C++, you know, in whatever way, do whatever do whatever auto conversion is possible. You know, just just get out of my way and let me play with C plus plus interactively. Um, so so that's quaternions. Um, you know, we can we can do something interesting. Uh, this looked better on a smaller screen. 
Let me zoom out slightly since the details aren't important. Um, so this is in Julia what we call a comprehension, which is basically just a um, compact syntax to generate an array by iterating over some Cartesian iteration space. So I just defined here, you know, a, a 10 by 10 array of, of different, different quaternions. And, you know, it, do, it doesn't have to be a matrix um, uh, if you wanted to, uh, okay. Uh, if you wanted to do multilinear quaternion algebra, which, you know, why not? Uh, you know, you could, oops, that was too much. But so Julia has very good support for multilinear algebra. And since, again, since everything in Julia is generic, you can also do multilinear algebra over C++ objects if you were so inclined. But uh, for uh, screen space efficiency, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the matrix. And, you know, just to, just to drive the point home that I made earlier about generic programming, you know, uh, matrix addition uh, works fine. Um, matrix multiplication does not, and it will tell you why. Uh, for matrix multiplication, it would like to know what the zero element is, so we can just tell it that, um, you know, by just defining it in the same way, you know, to get a zero element of CX quaternion of, you know, parameter, parameter type T, you know, just call the constructor we defined earlier. Um, with the zero element for that type. So we can do computations in the type domain, which is useful for things like this, for writing generic code. Um, um, and say, okay, just give me that four times and, and splat it in. So if we do that, you know, uh, matrix multiplication of, um, of arrays of these C++ values works automatically, right? Matrix multiplication is more complicated than just addition. You know, addition just adds everything that Matrix multiplication has um, uh, matrix multiplication ha has to do more complicated things, and you know Julia has various support for you know linear algebra over abstract data types as long as they define you know uh, plus minus division. So um, you know a little bit showing off Julia's generic programming capabilities with the example of it being a, a C plus plus value, uh, but but I hope you get some idea of you know, why, why we think some of this, this stuff is cool. Um, so I have a couple more minutes, and what, what I would like to do is, is, is tell you how it works, um, in, in sort of rough terms at least, because there, there were some questions about that. And some of that might be technical, so I, very technical, so I, I apologize if I, I lose some people. But basically, um, uh, so basically the way that the Julia compiler works is, you know, um, we, we parse code, um, and then we have some lowering, um, uh, and we do what we call type inference, which is basically devirtualization, um, um, and then you know we uh, we go to LLVM, um, and then you know we go to assembly, and. I, uh, yeah, so yes and no. So lowering is basically goes from an AST to a linear IR representation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to macros that I was going to add some extra arrows. So uh, this is sort of the, the, standard, the standard Julia compiler pipeline. You know, it's, it's very uh, simple. Uh, you know, one sort of oddity about Julia is that arbitrary amounts of time can pass between any of these because you can parse first, you know, treat that as a first class data structure um, and then send it off to lowering later. But one thing that makes Julia very powerful is that you can hook um, into this process at any level. So if you wanted to hook in at parsing, um, th that'd be macros um, right here, which can, which can do, um, uh, which can do uh, syntactic rewrites. Uh, if you wanted to hook in after lowering, um, or not after lowering, but sort of during during the early parts of inference, um, there's something we call generated functions. Um, generated functions. And if you wanted to hook in at the LLVM level, 
um, there's something we call, uh, or there's you know, basically inline assembly for LLVM, which we call LLVM call. Um, uh, and cxx.jl uses all of these um, to, uh, to make the illusion work. So um, at, the, at the very top, you know, there's all of these various macros that you've seen me use throughout the entire talk. So in Julia, whenever I, um, let me make this slightly bigger again and actually go, go back to the top of the screen. Um, in Julia, whenever I, uh, whenever I uh, prefix a string literal with you know, a, a name, uh, that's actually a, a string macro. You know, in Lisp, you might call it a, a reader macro, but you know, we, uh, in, in Julia, it has to be delimited by string literals because that makes uh, arbitrary reader macros just make all kinds of tooling horrible. But, um, so this is, you know, oops, didn't mean to hit enter that early. Um, but so, so, you know, this is, uh, this is a macro. So th this hooks in at the macro stage and it gets the raw text and uh, it, it, turns it, um, it turns it into something. So the ICXX debug macro is something that, that we haven't seen yet, but it's sort of a you know, debugging and introspection macro that I add. And it, it basically shows you given you know, something that you would put in an ICXX macro, what's the Clang AST that it actually generated under the hood. And um, you know, if you're, again, I apologize for um, the, uh, all of the, the word salad on the screen, but the, the main point is basically that what it did was it, oh, we can even see it here. So one thing I, since I didn't make any typos, we didn't see any errors, but uh, you get Clang you know, C++ syntax errors. In this case, I, I forgot a semicolon. So basically what it gave to uh, Clang to parse was basically, you know, Julia var one plus Julia var two. Um, and then Clang gave us this, uh, it wrapped it in a, and told Clang, okay, parse this as a function. as a function decalin and says Clang, and Clang said, okay, no problem. You know, um, this is, uh, and this is a, a function decal with, you know, Julia var one and Julia var two, both of which are quaternion double, and then you know we did, we went through the standard, um, uh, standard C plus um, plus thing. So, you know that, that that's um, um, that's the macro. So let me uh, pull in the debugger to actually step into uh, to actually step into some of the the guts of this. So. Um, uh, let's say I, I had, let's do this exact function. So, uh, okay. so you know, this is a, um, uh, just a simple function and we can, we can step into it with the, um, uh, we can step, we can step through it in the, actually, let me mm -hmm. show off what we're going to step through first. So, um, uh, so at, at code lowered, if you look into, if you look back at our handy little chart here, at code lowered shows you what the code looks like uh, after lowering. So all the macros have been expanded. So if we say at code lowered, you know, what does the code look like with the macro expanded? Well, um, it says, okay, call a function in the C++ library, um, which is you know, an implementation function. There's a, a reference to a compiler. You can have multiple instances of Clang. Say, you know, one has RTTI, one doesn't have RTTI, one is actually an Objective-C compiler. You know, all kinds of things that, that, that people actually want. It has a reference to the compiler. Um, and then it says, okay, you know, we're gonna operate on buffer 59, which, it, which the macro generated, and then it passes, uh, passes the values. So basically anything that you wrote here in the, in, in the interpolation it would paste as a Julia AST uh, in this case. So this, at this point, is a purely syntactic rewrite. So it doesn't know anything about types. So you know, no C++ parsing or expansion has been done yet because in order for C++ to do overload resolution, it needs to know what the actual types are. So that is not available, um, available at this stage. In, in this diagram, inference is the thing that, that deals with types. So this is purely a syntactic rewrite, and it's a complicated syntactic rewrite. Uh, 
but it's it's a syntactic rewrite nonetheless. Um, okay, so let's go back to the debugger, um, and you know we can we can step through all the calls that we just saw in lowering um, until until we get to this one. So uh, CXX stir impl is uh, what I called a generated function in this diagram, which means that it's basically a compiler callback. So when this function gets called, um, Julia will, if it doesn't have a cached value, call back into the compiler and ask it to generate code for it. So since the generating code part of this is more complicated, uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is just step into the function as if it were a regular function. So you know, ignore the fact that it's a, that it's a generated function um, and uh, I apologize for the debugger. If it, since the generated function doesn't have source info, so it just shows the first line of the compiler. But if we step through it, uh, you see a bunch of calls, and eventually, um, you know, we end up at an LLVM call. So what this generated function did is it analyzed what we've, we we parsed in and told Clang, you know, generate me some LLVM, and then we at this point, you know, we're feeding the LLVM back in to our standard compiler pipeline um, through the LLVM call intrinsic. So we can look at that in some more detail um, by using cxx.jl, and you'll, you'll see why I wrote cxx in, in this very example. So um, there is a, is a file LLVM includes, it just has a bunch of hash includes for various LLVM headers that I like. Um, but what we can do is we can um, so this pointer that it passes to LLVM call is an LLVM function pointer. Oops. Um, and this is, again, using cxx.jl. PCPP is just a convenience macro for you know, pointer to this type. Um, right, so we went into C++ mode and said, okay, C++, please call the LLVM dump function. So you can you know, call C++ code in dynamic libraries. Um, LLVM is already loaded because Julia uses it. If it weren't loaded, you could DL open it, yeah, just as usual. But so you know, this is basically the, um, the LLVM function, the LLVM IR that Clang generated. And it's very simple. It basically just has you know, three um, pointers to Julia. You know, Julia uses LLVM types, but CXX doesn't. Um, retain them, it just says they are i8 uh, double star, but basically um, what Clang what Clang emitted was that, you know, which is very simple LLVM IR, you know, with eventually just a call to this function declaration that it defined earlier with, you know, the two Parmva decals that we saw. And, you know, this is, this is standard C++, you know, LLVM, LLVM will go, go nuts on this, right? And then, you know, it does inlining and all the, all the standard all the standard things that, that LLVM does. So, you know, th this can uh, generate quite efficient code, um, you know, sort of zero overhead and even, you know, inter-language inlining between levels of C and C++ if you all run it on the same um, LLVM execution engine. Uh, so, so that's that. Um, but let's, let's quickly go back to, um, to this and... Uh, where was I? Yeah, there. Yeah. Oops, now I want it. Uh, so there's a command in the debugger sg, which will step into the generated function. And uh, again, the generated function is basically a compiler plugin. So uh, we're in the generated function now, and you know, I don't have too much time to actually step through all of it. But just to give you a rough idea. You know, it had this uh, buffer 59 reference um, that the macro created and, you know, then looks that up um, to say, okay, you know, what's, what's the buffer that, you know, reference value 59 refer to? Uh, you know, what's the, what's the file name? In this case, none, because we did it at the, at the REPL, but if you did it in a file, you would get actual source locations, which is nice for, you know, errors and debugging. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Uh, the next thing it does is generate this, um, uh, generate, oops, 
wrong prompt, uh, generate this function decal that we saw earlier that I printed out, you know, um, and we can see it again. Um, you can see it again here, right? You know, the, the function decal. So, and, and, oh, and the important point is at this point, we're in the generated function. And what the generated function gets as arguments is the types of the values that it was called with. So at this point, you know, the 59 was part of the type. Um, and it also knows at this point what the uh, types of the two, uh, the two A's are that we passed in as arguments. So it, know, it knew that they were both, you know, um, uh, quaternions of double. So at this point, you know, we generated a clang level uh, function declaration that uh, was specific to adding two doubles, uh, or quaternions of doubles, which uh, allowed clang to do the standard, you know, static, static overload resolution. Um, yeah, so, so we did that. Um, then you know we told Clang, hey, go ahead and generate some some LLVM code for this. Um, here's some some extra code which has to do with various nested callbacks where it, you know needs to generate templated lambdas basically to to do callbacks. Complicated topic. Let's skip over it. And, and then you know it's it's very simple. It just says Clang, hey, that function declaration that you just um, that you just declared, give me a reference for it, and then generate a call to this reference. And there's some trickery buried in here, which basically fixes up what Clang's notion of the parameter is at the LLVM level, so which connects you know, the Julia uh, declaration to the C++ declaration, it basically says, OK, for this parameter, rather than you know, using the first argument of this LLVM function that you generate, you know, use the first argument, but bit cast it to whatever pointer type you were expecting. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of details here, but, but that's basically the high level. You know, tell, tell Clang to generate the function declaration, tell Clang to call it with, um, with our arguments, and you know, some uh, trickery for move constructors and various other things that I'm, that I'm not showing, but, but that's basically the idea. Um, and you know, then, then we're back. So this was, since we did the SG, it stepped through the compiler. Now we're back to where we were before, where you know, if we step in, um, we'll get to the LLVM call that the compiler just generated. Um, okay, and the timer tells me that I went three minutes over from what I was supposed to. Um, but yeah, are there any questions about this? I know some of this was very fast and lots of text, but yes. Uh, so, I mean, we, I showed an LLVM example. So there, it used LLVM in the dynamic library. Um, you know, you can. It has a complete C plus plus compiler, so you can compile arbitrary C plus plus code. Um, you know, you don't really want to because you know this has all of the comp compile time disadvantages of C plus plus, but at runtime. So, you know, if you can run into problems, and I plan for the future to do pre-compiled modules to, to help with that. That you know it's a full C compiler, so anything a C compiler can do, um, you can do here. So that, does that answer the question? Was there something specific you were looking yeah, for? Yeah, I guess it, I was just thinking. Oh, for the recording the question was uh, can you do non-header only C libraries? So. Um, I think I answered my question. I, I was just going back to the tool and doing yeah. for sort of C plus plus things to include. Yeah. Yeah. If I wanted to do something like that very quickly but for a class, a header can be an important class. Yeah, so you know you could hash include the .cpp file, which would work. Um, you could you know compile this cpp file to a dynamic library and deal open it. And as long as you know the header file is accurate, that'll work. Um, you know, is uh, um, I, yeah, I think I think those are basically the options. Uh, so in theory, yes, I haven't done explore too much in that direction. Um, uh, to be honest, this is basically as much as it could do three years ago, and in the meantime, I've been working mostly on Julia itself. Um, but yeah, there's there's lots of there's lots of those kinds of and you know automatic detection of you know 
these kinds of things sort of correspond. Like, um, you know, Julia has very extensive libraries for colors and images. So, you know, if you're working with, um, say, OpenCV, which is one of the libraries wrapped with this, you could automatically, you know, introduce various conversion methods and all those kinds of automatic stuff. But I don't have any of that right now. Uh, does Julia have exceptions and uh, do the C++ exceptions? Like yes. Yes, yes, actually. Uh, that was actually really complicated to figure out. So uh, it worked at one point. Let me see if it still works. Yes, it worked, okay. Uh, so the, the red error thing is, uh, Julia printed it, and it, um, so if, uh, if you throw in Julia, um, uh, you know, it, it prints the red error thing, and then, and then the hello. And C++ thing, it does the same thing, but at the, at the Julia to C++ boundary, there's a custom personality function which translates from one exception domain into the other one and rewraps it as a Julia exception. So yes, uh, it works. How are Julia exceptions implemented? Are they like an item on it or are they... Uh, they... No, so um, Julia exceptions right now are set jump, long jump based yeah. uh, exceptions. Uh, we are planning to do better in future versions of, uh, of the language. Um, probably using an either monad for um, sort of uh, explicitly annotated exceptions. So if you have yeah. you know, an exception that you expect to occur mm -hmm. during regular control flow, like uh, a network exception that you can handle and you know, do, do a retry or whatever, as opposed to you know, terminating exceptions which, you know, uh, the world doesn't exist anymore, right? Like those kinds of exceptions that you would still want to catch in an interactive environment, you know, in case you can recreate the world somehow, um, but uh, wouldn't want to handle in regular control flow and, you know, pessimize the abort the world more by using dwarf based unwinding, for example, and, you know, less pessimization for the, um, for the common case where you expect to actually handle the exception in user code. Uh -huh. We're also working on that, and it might be a good idea. To sure. Do, uh, I'm not an expert. I yeah. Know a lot about this stuff, but please continue. Uh, can you ask about memory management in Julia? Sorry? Uh, can you describe oh, memory management? Oh, memory management, yeah. So, so uh, uh, Julia is a GC language, so um, we, you know, standard mark sweep, concurrent garbage collector. Um, uh, did you mean just in general or specifically with the C++ integration? No, just in general. Yeah, um, yeah so... Uh, well, that it, it leads to maybe some problems when interfacing with C++, you have to... Yeah, it, 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 it leads to problems. Um, so let me, uh, let me address the, the general manage memory management question first. Um, so uh, Julia in general is, is garbage collected um, with, with automatic uh, automatic memory management. Um, for performance, we often try to elide allocations if they, even if they are semantically there. So you know we can do various heap to stack promotions, uh, which is necessary for performance. And we can, you know, uh, we we can do various other tricks. But fundamentally, it is a, you know, a, a garbage collector language. With that, uh, with respect to C plus um, plus, you know, this this causes various problems. Um, in CXX, I introspect the destructor and see if it's interesting. If it's interesting, then it's slower because then it needs to use the finalizer mechanism in Julia to call the destructor when um, uh, to, to to call the destructor when the when the object goes out of scope. Um, it can also be annoying for interfacing with C++ libraries that expect you know scope based uh, you know uh, res uh, 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 resource ac acquisition is initialization. If libraries use that pattern, um, it can be sometimes hard to use them from Julia, sort of in the naive way. So if you, you know, the, the, the way to do that usually is then to just use a block of C++ with explicit scopes, um, because in Julia, you know, if uh, a library uses that pattern, the destructor will only get called when um, when it goes out of scope for GC processes, which might not be until some while afterwards. So C++ libraries can expect that to happen at the end of the scope, which in Julia it wouldn't. Um, and you know, I, I'm out of time, but I'm going to be around the rest of today.
and tomorrow morning. After that, I unfortunately have to go back and finish the release of this language, um, which is my actual job. But uh, you know, if this, I would be perfectly happy to take more questions, and you know, I'm sure there's questions for Bart as well. Uh, and I apologize for taking up all of the QA time. If anybody had questions of that nature, all right, thank you very much.